Hey everybody, it's Scott Weichel. You're listening to My Kind of Country right here on Fish Creek Radio. It's been more than three decades since John Schneider and Tom Wopat were just the good old boys, never meaning no harm. But the Dukes of Hazard co-stars are still very much a team. They have a fantastic Christmas album called Home for Christmas. And Tom Wopat has been a very successful actor and musician, not only in country music, but also in the pop and jazz, and also an actor on Broadway. So he is uh, staying a very busy man, and we're very happy he took time to be with us today. Would you please welcome Tom Wopat to My Kind of Country. Tom, how are you doing? Well, thanks, Scott. I'm doing just fine. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Just get ready for Christmas. I've got, a, got all the Christmas cookies baked, and we got them sent out to the kids. And me and my wife and the cats are, are getting hunkered down for the day itself here in a couple of days. All right. Have you had any snow out there yet? No, heck no. I'm in New York. Uh, no, we've not. I don't think we've seen a snowflake. Maybe actually like in the late October or something, but not recently. It's been 40s, 50s, 60s here in New York. Yeah, it's been that way here. I'm up in uh, northern Michigan, and it's very unusual for us this time of the year, but it looks like a green Christmas for us, so that's okay. How bizarre. <laughs> I know uh, I have friends out in the Pacific Northwest, and they've been getting dumped on. Oh, yeah, I know it. Well, that's okay. Well, I'm sure we'll get our share at some point, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, this uh, this album actually uh, came out last year, but it's just been recently reissued on vinyl. You know, I've, I've noticed a lot of artists are putting their stuff back on, on vinyl again. There seems to be a big resurgence in that. Are you still a uh, vinyl fan? Yeah, you know what? I mean, there's a, it's a different vibe, obviously. I mean, vinyl... If you really think about it, it's basically the same technology that Edison used when he first started out over 100 years ago. Um, you know, you, you have something that's, that's in direct contact with another surface, and that's how you get the sound back off it. Um, digital is digital, and, and the, the, uh, the way that the, the formats they've, they've been using to try to uh, get to the quality and fidelity of, of vinyl are getting better and better, but it's still not quite as warm as the sound of a record that's been uh, properly produced. I think you're absolutely right. I have a, a turntable that hooks into my computer, and I actually play a lot of records on my show. And I think you're right. You know, great. They, they, that's great. I, we have the same thing at our house. You know, it might be a nostalgia thing, but uh, I, I still like my vinyl, too. <laughs> Well, there's a, it, there's a different quality to it. It's a little warmer. Um, there's just a little more, to me, a little more depth and breadth of sound. I mean, you listen to like a, a really good orchestra on vinyl on, on a good recording, and it's astounding. I, 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 think, I think there is a, a distinct and audible difference. I think you're absolutely right, without a doubt. Well, I'm anxious to hear this on vinyl. And uh, tell me how this... It doesn't this... suck, I promise. Well, I know it doesn't suck. It doesn't suck on digital either. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me how this album came about. Well, you know, I've been making records for a long time, and John kind of quit about 20 years ago. He quit making records. Uh, but uh, I've long wanted to get him in the studio with me, and the thing about a Christmas record, of course, is that it's, it's an annual event. It, you can... You can sell them every year, and also that helps with uh, trying to do uh, live performances of stuff like that. And, and he and I have been doing live performance together for, I don't know, probably 15, 20 years. So a couple years ago, in 2013, I finally talked him into doing one. And we cut a couple of, uh, of uh, sides in, in December of that year. Then we finished the rest of it in the summer of 2014, where... You know, the summer is where most Christmas records get made, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, we finished putting it together in, in August, and it came out last October on CD, and was pretty highly regarded. Uh, we had some, we had good reviews from a lot of different places. Rolling Stone said it was one of the top ten new Christmas records of the year, and it just seemed to me that it was a natural for vinyl. The last uh, solo record that I've done, I put out on vinyl with uh, a compilation with some of the stuff from the CD before, uh, a double uh, vinyl record called uh, I've Got Your Number, and I really liked the way that that came out. I liked having the vinyl cover and the liner notes and that sort of thing. So we did it with this record as well. 
Yeah, I'm a. I like having the cover in my hands. I, you know, as, as you get a little bit older, it gets harder to read that fine print. You get a little bigger on those uh, those covers, you know. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, when I was a kid, we had those those Beatle records and Beach Boy records and all that stuff, uh, you know, Pink Floyd and all those really cool, iconic records. And, and you know, looking at a Zappa cover, I, that was that was pretty fun. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, or, or Jethro Tull or something like that. Yeah. So uh, it's just one of those things that, and, you know, uh, economically now it makes sense. They, they basically sell more vinyl now than they do CDs in this country. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, like, you know, you were talking about all those classic albums, you know, Dark Side of the Moon and all that stuff. You know, they, they put that right. all back on vinyl again, you know. Right. Well, there's a reason. Yep. <laughs> Well, some of the songs on this this album are just fantastic. You know, you've you've got some you know traditional standards, obviously. You know, I'll be home for Christmas and Silver Bells, but you know, you've got you've got some really humorous ones, and one that really stood out for me, and I I you know, I love the you know the uh, kind of cynical take on this one. It's Blue Xmas. Oh yeah, well that's a Bob Duro tune, and and Bob is Bob's still with us. Bob is uh, basically considered an American songbook writer. He. Uh, Devil May Care is a, just a huge hit of his. And uh, my producer, Dave Fink, brought this song to me, and I thought, oh, shoot, we got to do this. It is cynical, but it's beautiful. And uh, the definitive version is probably Bob singing it with Miles Davis, which is, is an amazing recording. But I think we did a nice job. There's a, um, it's a really nice arrangement. It's a, it's a Mounsey arrangement, Rob Mounsey, who did some arrangements for Steely Dan. So, you know, it's it's pretty high quality stuff. Absolutely. Well, another one I noticed uh, I, you guys kind of rewrote this for uh for the album. Oh, Johnny it's cold outside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I rewrote it. I rewrote it and I've apologized to the Frank Lesser Foundation <laughs> a couple of times for it. <laughs> but, you know, it's one of those things that we started doing actually 6 7 years ago in in our uh non-Christmas shows. Uh I thought it was fun, and uh, it's turned into something that uh, has been really, really well received. Absolutely. Well, another one that I really liked on there too was uh, "On a Quiet Christmas Morn." It's kind of a kind of a more country flavored one. Yeah. Well, we did this thing. Um, uh, Rob and and I think it's Lucinda. I think is her name. Uh, Robin and, and either that or Linda Williams. They're a couple. And I had I had had them on my show when I was doing primetime country in Nashville about 20 years ago, and uh, it was like a talk show. And then about you know when we were getting ready to make this record two years ago, I saw them at Town Hall in New York City with uh, Garrison Keillor on Prairie Home Companion. Oh yeah. Because Fink, the producer, was playing bass on that gig. So I saw them and I asked them because uh, I was looking for a couple of country things. And uh, they presented that to me. I thought it was a nice one. And we did that one. And then there's another country tune called uh, Even the Snow Falls for You that John sings. That I was I was really happy with both of them, the way they came out. Yeah, it's a great it's a great album. And I, you know, I like the little things, you know, about uh, the lump of coal on there and, you know, Ponch and John from uh, Chips. And <laughs> well, you know, what happened was in the, when we did the first two tunes in December of 13, we, we went into, in the the booth together in the vocal booth and of course there's there's a lot of bullshit that comes out of that and what i did was i had the engineer just record everything and we kept it for later then when we were sequencing the record i went and took the cd of all the comments there's like five hours of bs from the booth and i picked three or four little things that i thought were kind of appropriate and stuck them in there i think it really reflects our relationship and it kind of gives the the record a tone that is what i was looking for oh that's great and it's nice to let everybody know you guys had a good time doing this it shows in the music but you know like you said the little side comments in there it just gives everybody a little glimpse of what it was like to record that's really cool <laughs> yeah well we had a blast making it and we do I think we did maybe four shows last year at Christmas time and a couple of uh shows this year uh one in Louisiana and one down in Florida and hopefully we'll be doing it you know for the next 5 6 years. I I really enjoy working with John and he seems to have a good time working with the band. It's it's a lot of fun. 
Well, that's great to hear. You know, after all these years, and you know, you guys certainly have a long history together. Not only you know on the Dukes of Hazard, but uh, you both had very have had and still have very successful music careers. You know, and uh, it's you know you guys are great singers, and and you have done so much great acting roles, and uh, you've been nominated for a Tony Award and Annie Get Your Gun, and oh my gosh, Catered Affair, The Will Rogers Follies. You've just done a lot of great stuff. How did you get into? Well, I've been fortunate. I. I surround myself with good people and I've been able to make some decent decisions as far as what to do and and John is now he's got a studio a, a film studio down in Louisiana and he's doing what he loves and we managed to uh, keep our act together and and uh, you know we're blessed we've been we've been friends for almost 40 years and I expect it to go at least another 20. Oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful well you're both su super talented without a doubt I want to I want to go back and ask you about to, you know your beginnings in music. Who are some of your influences that kind of uh, you know led you well, there? Well, you know, I mean, I was twelve or thirteen when the Beatles showed up, and of course, so they're a huge influence. Uh, and of course, I've always been really fond of the singer-songwriters: James Taylor, Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell. Um, when I write, it's kind of in that vein a little more. Um, I like some of the more esoteric groups. I, I love the British groups, like I said, with Pink Floyd and Jethro Tull and God back there, King Crimson back in the day, those kind oh, of yeah. things. But, you know, and, and I've always been a big fan of the horn bands, um, Chicago and BS&T and, and then uh, Tower of Power was always a big favorite of mine. And I had a horn band back in Wisconsin back in the 70s. So, you know, I've had a lot of different influences, and fortunately, I've been able to uh, perform a lot of that music. That's great. Well, how how did you come to start recording some country music? Well, kind of, it was actually, you know, at the time I started recording in the 80s. I mean, of course, Dukes of Hazard was a huge phenomenon. Uh, Urban Cowboy had just been a big hit. And actually, I think uh, probably country music was really kind of the M.O.R., the middle-of-the-road music of the day. And so it just made sense to kind of tap into that. I think actually once I moved over to doing the uh, the standards, I think that's a little more comfortable fit. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think my voice is more um, more geared to that type of stuff. But I've always enjoyed the country stuff, and I still do. You had a couple of great songs. One one of my very favorites, and I play it on my show quite a lot, is uh, called "Full Moon, Empty Pockets." Oh my God, that's off the first <laughs> record. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, I tell you what. The thing is, on that record, um, just so you know, this was my first foray into recording. And when they made the the uh, AM version of that tune, they cut off the intro, that that vocal intro. Oh. There's a there's an acapella vocal intro to it. And then when they cut the album, instead of reattaching the two, they left about 10 seconds in between that intro and the, and the body of the song. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, the first time I heard it, I about threw up. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be hooked right together, and, there, and nobody made the connection. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's still a great tune, but if you can, try to... <laughs> Vocal intro up to the rest of the I'll, I'll have to do that. I had it on a uh, 45, and there what that vocal intro wasn't there, so I'm, I'll have to hunt that up, and I'll, I'll splice them back together, and we'll put it on for you. How's that? <laughs> you got it. It's on the album. It's on the LP. I and they still float around. I've got about a dozen of them. I just found in the storage unit from Nashville. Nice. Well, I uh, also found a version of that song by Stonewall Jackson. He had recorded How it. How is it? Yeah. It's really good. I, I was quite surprised. Oh, yeah. Well, he's terrific. Yeah. It was back at the time he was doing, you know, me and me and you and a dog named Boo and songs like That's that. Right. You know? Yeah, and another another one that I always liked was "Too Many Honky Tonks on My Way Home." That was on Epic Records. Yeah, well, that was the last that was the last big country record I made. Uh, that was the one I made with Rick Hall down in Muscle Shoals, and uh, he was a trip, man. He's still alive. They have a, a documentary about him in Fame Studios. Oh, nice. Yeah, so that's a big deal. Check out Rick Hall. Go online and check him out. He's like, you know, got to be close to 90 now, and he was nuts back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, they say only the good die young, right? <laughs> that's it. 
That's it. That's, that's awesome. Well, folks, you can go to uh, TomWopat.com, and, of course, you can check out all of Tom's music there. Uh, the album with uh, John Schneider, the Christmas album, is available at Amazon.com, iTunes, and all the uh, usual suspects online, and, of course, Walmart and, and FYE and Ernest Tubb Record Shops, just about anywhere music is sold, you can get this fabulous album. And, of course, TomWopat.com has all of your tour dates on there. You've been staying real busy, I've noticed. Trouble. <laughs> well, that's a full-time job, isn't it? <laughs> that's pretty much that's that's a fact. <laughs> well, how did the uh, how did the Auto Trader commercial come about? Well, they basically called my agent, and and actually John and I have the same commercial agent, and they called with the idea of us doing you know getting back into General Lee and offered us a kind of an obscene amount of money, and we said that makes sense to us, and so we went ahead and did it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it's very nostalgic for people like me that you know grew up watching the show. My daughter is nine and a half years old, and about a year ago, I was watching uh, some Dukes of Hazard on CMT, and she just got hooked. And man, she's got she's got all the little cars, you know, the General Lee and you know Boss oh, yeah, House car yeah. and all that. And Excellent. She's like, you're gonna talk to Tom Wopat. That's so cool. <laughs> Excellent. So you tell her you got you've got a fan there. How she's gonna be real happy to hear you. I was real sorry to hear that James Best passed away. Yeah, that was unfortunate, but, you know, we all go sometime, and I actually just did a big event down there with Ben Jones down in their Sperryville shore, uh, store. Mm -hmm. They have uh, Cooters down there in Sperryville, Virginia, and mm -hmm. that was a blast. Oh, that's cool. Well, James Best, you know, a lot of folks don't know. He he was in a lot of westerns in his early days. You know, oh, yeah, he was, a, he was a pretty decent film star at the time. Yeah, and uh, a real good painter, too. He did a lot of really cool paintings. Yep. And, Yep, he did a bunch of really cool stuff. I bet you learned a we've lot been, from him. We've been blessed. We had a good bunch. Absolutely. What is your take on this whole uh, rebel flag controversy? You know what? I really don't have a take on it. I, yeah, I, I understand for those who have a, a real aversion to the Confederate flag, I understand their point of view. I think that our involvement with it, with it was kind of ancillary. I think we were kind of collateral damage um, because our show never had anything to do with any of that stuff, really. Yeah. It was just basically a paint scheme for the car and, you know, the whole South, that, that the Confederacy has always been a big calling card of theirs. It never really had anything to do with slavery or racism or any of that stuff. So I pretty much stayed out of the fray and... Uh, I figure, you know, it'll all pass. It's one of those things that, uh, unfortunately, we got caught up in, in the, the actions of a, a crazy individual down there in South Carolina. Well, if anything, I guess it's probably uh, brought some good PR to uh, the old Dukes of Hazard stuff anyway. You know, they say anytime <laughs> they mention your name, any, any PR is good PR. So yep, there you go. Absolutely. I, uh, you know, you've had a couple albums that I wanted to just mention real quick that I really, really love, and one of them was called In the Still of the Night. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's the first one that I did that in, it really involved the songbook. That was with Russ Teitelman, who's a two-time Grammy Award winner. He was a producer on that, and we still perform a lot of that stuff. The Jimmy Webb tunes off there and Making Whoopie and... There's there's a lot of really good songs on that record. What we did after that was I, I did an Arlen record because I was doing an Arlen tour, a Harold Arlen record, and then I did a couple that are a little more I don't know, a little more geared towards a, a saloon, a little more of a big band kind of thing, kind of the Sinatra and and uh, the Bobby Darin kind of orchestra slash big band hybrid and we've done a couple of those records and i'm really proud of those so one one's called consider it swung and the other one's called i've got your number oh yeah those and i think both albums. of them are, are really swinging and and uh, really have an interesting approach well i like the harlan Har yeah, harold arlen album that you did too you know, one of the nice things that you've done recording these songs is, is you've brought them to a new generation. You've brought them, you know, back into the limelight. You know, some of these are really old songs. And Yeah, know, yeah. Well, he was an amazing writer. He's the most famous writer you've never heard of. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> but, you know, the, you know, you know the songs, and it's... Uh, yep, yeah, it's, that's the thing. You know, we were talking about the vinyl thing earlier. Every time, you know, there's a format change, you kind of lose some things in the shuffle there that they don't get transferred. Right. And, and I'm really glad to see that, you know, you're carrying on these, uh, these songs and getting them back out there again for people, and in a great way, too. Well, I 
appreciate it, ma'am. Well, what's uh, what's on tap for you? What's what's coming up next for you? Well, I got an idea to do some singer songwriter record. I've been doing some things for YouTube, uh, little solo things where it's me and piano or me and guitar, and those will be coming out in the next few months. I expect by the end of next year to have another another album put together. And I also have uh, some ideas for another record with John if I can hog tie him long enough to get him to do it. <laughs> well, that would be great. I know all your fans will look forward to that, and uh, we'll stay tuned to your website, TomWolpat.com. And uh, folks, go see Tom if you get a chance. He's just an outstanding entertainer, and uh, you, you put on a great show. you got a great band up there, and it's fabulous. And I was blessed to see you some years ago, and, man, I'll tell you, I was thoroughly entertained. Well, I appreciate it, man. You take care. Have a great time. Tell your daughter, hey. I will do that. Tom Wopat on My Kind of Country, thank you so much for being on the show, Tom. You bet. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Tom Wopat. Right, bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Tom Wopat as we continue with My Kind of Country right here on Fish Creek Radio.